uh, staying on the market, our next guest says, with the path of least resistance for stocks seemingly lower, uh, stabilization in rate volatility, clarity on the path of monetary policy are going to be key. Joining us this morning, Charles Schwab, uh, Chief Investment Strategist, Lizanne Saunders is with us. Lizanne, uh, great to have you. So I guess Hi, what's going to deliver that? Can Powell help deliver that? Um, I'm not so sure. I, you know, it, I, the, the real question is whether he makes comments specific to the breakout in yields on the upside. I, you know, it, it, it's a it, it's sort of a tough needle he's trying to thread in terms of still probably finding frustration in his inability to convince markets that significant rate cuts are not happening next year. So th that to me is probably first priority for, for Powell, but I'm not inside his head. So, uh, but that's what I'd be looking for to see uh, what his comments are with regard to the, uh, the breakout on the upside in yields. Right. You know, it's been interesting. You know, last week, it was just last week we were talking about the blowout in retail sales, uh, consumer flush with uh, real wages that were inflecting positive. And now it's about sort of global PMIs and maybe not we're not looking at the growth trajectory we thought. Is that just part and parcel of the environment we're in? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously been a very unique economic cycle. and There's so many cross currents on a day to day basis, whether it's dividing the economy into the goods versus uh, services, trying to figure out the excess savings story and whether that's been a driver of strong consumer spending or whether it's more of the attachment to the, the labor market. You did see better than expected retail sales, but those are expressed in nominal terms. There's still enough inflation that in real terms, we actually really haven't made much movement in a metric like retail sales in the last couple of years. And then you've had some of the, the pretty concerning stories about uh, shrinkage. And I, I think the the sort of enthusiasm around that Atlanta GDP now cast hitting 5.8, um, that started to be tempered by virtue of some additional data that's come in, to your point, PMIs, some of the data today, durable goods, showing that maybe the economy isn't quite as robust as we might have thought on that day that GDP now came out at 5.8. And Harker also mentioning the impact of the student loan repayments, which will resume uh, in October, not to mention a number of retailers, Liz, from Walmart to Macy's, among others, uh, referencing how that could put more pressure on the U.S. consumer. How, do you how are you factoring that in? So given the limited penalty associated with not uh, paying student loans, we'll have to see how much uh, kind of take up of the moratorium ending happens. But it is the case that we have started to see pressure on the consumer. If you break the excess savings, what's left of it into income cohorts um, on the lower end of the spectrum, much if not all of that, and then some is exhausted, and that's why you're seeing this increased use in revolving credit. You are starting to see delinquencies kick in in areas like auto loans in addition to credit cards tends to be a bit more concentrated in subprime. But even up the income spectrum, what you're hearing from retailers to the extent they want to provide the fine-tooth comb details is that there is more of a focus on, on um, you know, non-brand names. Um, you, we've seen the pressure in terms of, of unit volume. So it's really important in this environment with any of the consumer data to look at both the nominal data, which is how it's typically reported, but also the real data, which is a bit more somber. You know, we're in this interesting time across the country, Liz, where there are either unions threatening a strike or already on strike, and some have been successful getting those pay raises. I look at to UPS as an example, uh, but now we look to the union auto workers and to see what could happen there. But just curious how that could play a role in wage inflation and whether Powell perhaps addresses that tomorrow in his speech. So I think it, it brings up a really good uh, topic, which is the, I think, the transition that we're likely in the midst of to a very different secular environment. This has been our thesis for a while, and I think it's starting to, to show itself more clearly, which is, I think, labor taking a greater share of GDP, basically labor 
pulling power away from capital or labor representing a larger share of GDP than profits, where it had been the opposite with profits representing the highest share of GDP. I think we're seeing that there. And as it relates to the tie-in to inflation, um, I think we're entering a period that predated the great moderation. The, the 30 years or so from the mid-60s to the mid to late 90s looked very different than the great moderation. And it was a period of more elevated volatility and a global economy more subject to supply shocks. And I think that's likely what we're transitioning into. That's not the same thing as saying inflation is going to stay high in perpetuity, but more inflation volatility. And one of the drivers of that is probably labor sort of, you know, taking some power away from what had been the power of, of profits. Yeah. No, that pendulum uh, after 40 years uh, starting to swing for sure. You know, Lizanne, there is still a camp that um, whether it's NVIDIA or just earnings guidance for the quarter in general, that there's no reason to think that the trough earnings thesis is broken, that they that earnings are going to start to rebound somewhat. And then that that's going to lead to a supportive Q4 and maybe into 24. Do you, do you have a problem with that? Um, not necessarily. The question is, what is the lift to the extent that we have seen a trough? And I'm not so sure we have seen a trough. Calendar year 2023 estimates have been nudging up, but that's largely because of what were better than expected seasons in the first and second quarter. You haven't seen much movement in the second half of the year. I also think that companies are not providing the same kind of precision around guidance. And I think what that's left analysts to do is be more near term in nature as far as adjusting the out numbers, wait for the earnings season, listen to their companies, maybe make an adjustment to one quarter out. So I'm not sure how much true validity the out quarters into the fourth quarter has. So I wouldn't bank a lot on those consensus numbers as if they're close to reality. And we also have to remember that the rally off the October lows last year was all multiple expansion without yet any benefit from earnings. And with the breakout in yields and a higher discount rate, all else equal, that has put downward pressure on some of the more highly valued segments of the market. I think we need to see stability in earnings. I'm not sure we can bank on that turn coming simply because that's what consensus shows for the latter part of this year. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, corporates are already undercovered and, and with, the, with less information, it's, it's harder. People make fun of revisions, but it's arguably what are they supposed to do that work right. with what they have? Uh, Lizanne, right. thanks. Great to see you. Lizanne Saunders. Thanks,